We got ourselves a classic last night, featuring two of the best teams in the NBA playing in a playoff atmosphere, even though it feels weird to describe a Clippers-Nets game in those terms. But the sheer star power across the board made everyone bring their A game, and there were lots of subplots to go through, so let's get into the footage to explain why this game was the most intense matchup of the regular season. The marquee matchup was KD versus Kawhi, and that might explain why KD only took 13 shots. But wouldn't you know it, he hit 11 of them, and the low field goal count is primarily due to his offensive positioning, languishing in the corner as a spectator on far too many offensive possessions. I'm not sure if KD is okay with this, but I'd at least want him moving off some sort of weak side action instead of simply trying to use his gravity to pull the defense out of the way. It didn't start off that way, as the Nets immediately went to the post against Kawhi, and there wasn't much Leonard could do to stop this face-up jumper besides hope it missed. When going against a team that features elite defenders like Kawhi and Paul George, the Nets would want to find the path of least resistance by using screens to force switches. However, the Clippers let them off the hook at times, putting Batum on KD, who is in terrible top lock position here and allows the easy layup. Kawhi did get caught trying to deny the pass to the wing, allowing KD to cut back door for the nice pass and the and one. Early in the third, here's an example of setting a screen to force Kawhi to switch off of KD. But Toom again puts himself in foolish position gambling for a steal, and it gives Durant a wide open 12-footer. But if you were wondering why Nash had Durant stuck in the corner so gosh darn much, here's a reason. Out of horns, they run a pin down, notice it's Morris on him as they decide to sick Kawhi on Harden, and he calmly hits the relatively open elbow jumper. On the flip side, you can see the Clippers trying to force Kyrie to pick up Kawhi on the ball screen, but the Nets do an excellent job to hedge and recover, but no matter. A quick two-dribble diagonal attack gets him three inches of space to release this 12-footer over KD. But this possession made little sense to me. They had a weak defender in Harden guarding Leonard out top. Why bring the ball screen up to him and allow KD to switch? He can't get into the lane against the excellent KD defense and misses the jumper on the good contest. Durant's length clearly affects Kawhi's game, as he was intent on denying the pass to him in the first place. And then, as the Paul George drive gets to the block, KD stunts to help and can get back to contest the short corner three into a brick. More disruption on the deflection as Kawhi really doesn't have an advantage against him on the elbow, but he realizes he's got an extra step of space off the jab step and hits this right in KD's eye. Let's move on to James Harden, who dished out 14 dimes in this game in his newfound role as facilitating point guard. With a guy like DeAndre Jordan, your alley-oop passes don't need to be very accurate at all, as he seems to be able to grab all manner of balls out of the air and propel them violently through the hoop. It's remarkable how much more of a passer he's become on this team, and it makes sense playing alongside KD and Kyrie, but Joe Harris has gotten the second most of Harden's assists, behind KD, and it was hard to believe the defense handled this pick and roll so poorly. The help on ball is from Zubats, and Reggie Jackson should be seeking the help on the roll man. Morris most definitely shouldn't be in this position, especially off the best shooter in the league, and that's an easy bucket that gets them back the lead in the fourth. If you analyze the box score stats, you might wonder why the Clippers were able to stay so close throughout the game considering the disparity in field goal percentage. And the answer is simple, turnovers. Remember, not all turnovers are the same. It's the live ball miscues that turn right into scoring plays that really kill a team, and Kawhi greatly benefited from the opportunistic Clippers defense. While KD hit a couple of shots on Kawhi, he also got stripped by him here that led to two points on free throws at the other end, and then later he reads this pass early, tips it to half court before swooping in for the dunk to break another tie. Having both Kawhi and Paul George is an embarrassment of riches for this team since they're both defensive playmakers. Check how PG cuts Kyrie off and leaves him flailing out of bounds, and this 5-on-4 leads to another Kawhi score with a little runner off the glass to tie the game in the third. Earlier in the game, when KD was pretty passive on offense despite having Batum on him, he throws this ball in the traffic, and PG turns this deal into an attack right into Durant's chest. 
with the beautiful Euro step around him getting the lefty finger roll. Remember what I said about defensive matchups? The Clippers had more targets to attack and get two of the weaker links involved with both Kyrie and James Harden in this pick and roll. This was a weird hedge by Kyrie coming from the outside and it appears Harden thought it was a straight up switch. Zero communication between them. As a result, it left Paul George with a straight line drive when Joe Harris couldn't rotate over in time. Another example of attacking the weaker link in the defense. The ball screen gets the solid defender in Bruce Brown off of George, who takes Jeff Green right into the lane. This is not a travel, folks. As he plants the right foot as the pivot, he's allowed to take as many steps with the left foot as he likes, as long as the right foot doesn't move, which it doesn't until he jumps into the air for the layup. Jeff Green was clearly a target for him as he continues to impress with his 50-40-90 shooting season alongside Kawhi, who amazingly has the same shooting splits. On this high post split, if the cutters can't get open coming out of the corner, the secondary action is a pin down for George on the weak side. Green does a good job to deny the pass on the switch to PG, but the progression flows nicely into a blind pig action as Ibaka bounces it to the cutting George, who shoots right over Harden for the easy jumper. Deep in the fourth, with the Clippers desperate for a basket, they catch Harden guarding George. And this is just embarrassing. Harden shouldn't be stepping over like this one pass away against an elite shooter anyway, and then promptly gets beat backdoor for the dunk to keep the Clippers in the game. But there's absolutely no question that what enabled the Nets to overcome the Clippers can be summed up in two words. Kyrie freaking Irving. In a game with this many top players, you got to be special to stand out as much as he did to the tune of 39 points on 15 of 23 shooting, including 6 of 8 from 3. And this is where the Clippers really missed Patrick Beverly. Even when the defense maintained its positions and matchups perfectly, Reggie is right there to contest the shot, it doesn't matter, and Kyrie gets going early. On this possession, I was scratching my head why they'd bring Kawhi over to ball screen with his man since it just gets Kawhi onto the ball. But oh my, he hits him with a violent crossover into quick release and the only complaint was that his toe was on the line, earning him only two points. I mean, this sort of thing doesn't happen to Kawhi Leonard of all people. They did it again on the right side, with KD screening to the outside and Kyrie rejecting the screen to avoid Kawhi and the degree of difficulty is high. The Russian judge might take off points from musical interpretation, but he performs a Euro off-foot runner over to the defender for a swish. Another ball screen from KD and another move to go away from Kawhi and keep Reggie on him, who does a tremendous job defensively on this step back to the corner, but my goodness, again, it just doesn't matter. And that brings us to the key run that decided the game. Watch how setting the screen for Kyrie with Kawhi's man isn't to get Kyrie attacking, it's to force the switch and let KD go to work. Batum does an admirable job to keep in front of him, but he's just not long enough to bother this pull-up half-jumper, half-floater from 10 feet out to cut the lead to three. Yet another ball screen from KD, and this time, Kyrie accepts the challenge when Kawhi steps up the switch by cold burying this shot over the claw to tie the game. It's hard to believe that the Clippers couldn't get matched up properly with this slow of a transition, but Kawhi is late recognizing he needs to pick up Kyrie, Paul George lets him get around without much effort, and their next best defender is in good position until he just euros laterally around him, but then finishes with the inside hand flip over the head. This is too good, folks. The highest display of skill on the basketball court when it comes to finishing at the rim. The Clippers run a good ball screen to get Leonard wide open after getting around the Kyrie hedge, but he leaves it short. And someone explained to me why Batum doesn't pick Kyrie up. I mean, he never really stops the ball, allowing him to easily pull up for an open three that tickles the twine and makes this a 10-0 run. The Nets see George guarding Harden, so they force a the switch to attack Batum, someone they clearly don't respect as a defender. Unless you forgot that James Harden made a name for himself as an MVP for his scoring prowess, particularly the step back three variety, here's your reminder that caps a 13-0 run for an eight point lead late in the game. Where this got interesting was when some curious clock management bit the Nets in the butt. Up seven going to the final minute of the game. The Nets should want to take time off the clock before mounting an attack. Instead, KD goes way early and then jumps into the air to pass back across the court when Reggie Jackson had been standing there the whole time. While the defense does get back to prevent an immediate score, they're cross-matched, and Marcus Morris has a mouse in the house, taking Kyrie into the lane for the floater plus the foul. 
So this time, Harden brings the ball up and his basketball IQ is off the charts for a lot of reasons. He certainly understood the importance of taking time off the clock before getting a shot. And it's so nice that the Nets have him for exactly these situations, where he's made his money for the past five years. But he ends up essentially punching Morris in the face. He's lucky this wasn't upgraded to a flagrant one foul, but it's part of his regular move to put his bent elbow on the shoulder of his man. It just so happened on this one that Morris's face was in the path of his hand. Harden knew it, couldn't argue it, so the Clippers get another chance down by only four. They have to go quick since this is still basically a two possession game, but this out of bounds play was not designed well. Reggie screens to get Kawhi open, that's fine, but then he's left with nowhere to go. The spacing is suboptimal and allowed Kyrie to jump into the path, force Kyrie to pull the ball back early, and then KD finishes it off with a good contest into an air ball from eight feet. The Clippers get very fortunate to get the ball back on the deflection. I like this out of bounds play better. Watch PG back screen for Kawhi, the Nets switch this to stop the dive by Leonard, but it gets KD chasing, and on the cross screen, another switch. Kudos to Harris for trying, but PG hops, shoots right over him, and now it's a one point game. The Clippers have to foul or else the clock would wind down. I don't understand why they didn't try to trap and get a steal first, but they had a foul to give and another curious decision. I like what Harden did here to look like he was attacking, but they should have brought this ball back out and took more time off the clock. Instead, KD flies in there too quickly and has very real pressure on him to make both free throws. Ty Lu clearly knows the Nets are going to foul up by three, maybe because he watched my video from two weeks ago when the Nets screwed this up against the Cavs, but then correctly took the foul two other times since. KD smartly lets them take a couple extra seconds off before fouling. After cutting it to one with no timeouts left, the Clippers needed to foul immediately. Watch Batoon stuck to Kyrie moving towards half court as every other defender moves up to foul the receiver of the pass. Batum has no idea he's the farthest guy back and never sees Jeff Green jog by him to the basket. But James Harden certainly does, firing the football pass the length of the court. And while Reggie did his best to take the foul and prevent the shot, the damage was done, the basketball gods upset, and of course the ball rolls in. The Clippers still had a chance on the missed free throw and the Nets almost got caught with their pants down. What if they didn't call this foul on Harden? They should have been in better position on this PG attempt, but Harden again shows his IQ by taking the foul and eliminating a chance for the Clippers to tie it with a three. But that doesn't excuse their poor positioning. Joe Harris should have been closer to Paul George just in case they didn't call the foul. Of course, Batum misses the free throw he wanted to make and then inexplicably makes the free throw he wanted to miss. And that basically ends the game. A memorable contest with intriguing matchups that forced the best players in the league to dig deep into their bag and also give us a ton of things to be excited about if we could get this matchup in the NBA Finals. If you like this video, you're going to love my new YouTube membership. There are three tiers to choose from, all with tremendous bonus content, including private watch parties. Join me for the next time these two play, and you can come on the show as well. You in?